Today I'm going to talk about the complement system. Now this complement system also goes by the name of complement cascade and we know that cascade means series of reactions or series of different steps. In this particular complement system, many different reactions, many different steps are involved and ultimately its goal is to kill pathogen by creating pore. Now this complement system is a system that aids the whole immune system and it ultimately kills the pathogen by creating holes in their surface. I will come to the detail of all the steps in a moment, but let's just look at the idea behind complements. What exactly is a complement? Complements are actually group of proteins that are present in our blood serum and they are activated with the help of these structures. You can see the structure of antibody here we have the purple region which is the constant region of antibody and then we have different colors here orange green and so on they are depicting or representing the variable region so upper one is the constant region and lower at the bottom you can see the variable region these structures activate this complement system or they are involved in the activation of the whole complements that ultimately create pore or hole within the body of this bacteria now this is a bacteria with its surface or membrane and it is a lipid bilayer with the embedded proteins as you can see on your screen. So before discussing the complex idea or complex process involved in the complement system, let's just look at a number. We know that there are almost 30 different kinds of types of complement proteins that are present in our blood. But only nine, almost nine complements are involved in the pathway, which is known as classical pathway. Now this complement system is subdivided into three pathways. The first one is classical pathway. Second one is the alternative pathway and third one is lectin pathway. But in this part of the video, I'm going to discuss the first pathway, which is the classical pathway. And our main focus would be on the first two pathways, classical and the alternative pathway. Lectin pathway, the third pathway, lectin pathway is almost identical to the first pathway, which is classical pathway. So before starting the whole process, let's look at this number. We know that it is starting with one and ending at nine. It is in perfect order. And now the complements don't really work in this perfect order. The process begins with C1 or the complement one. But after C1, there is this turn of C4 complement and then comes C2 complement. And then at the fourth position, we actually have C3, the involvement of C3 complement. So we have to memorize the first portion of this whole number and then you can see there is five, six, seven, eight and nine that is in perfect order. So let's start with the whole process. Now we know that at first this antibody will move and it will attach itself to the surface of the bacteria, the target bacteria and then comes another antibodies. Actually, several antibodies will come and attach themselves on surface of bacterial pathogen. And then, then comes the C1. We know that C1 is further subdivided into three subunits, which are C1Q, C1R, and C1S. They also work in alphabetic order. At first, C1Q performs a duty, then comes the role of C1R, and then finally C1S. Now C1Q, the longer structures, these yellow structures, and then C1S and C1R are like smaller structures that are attached to these bigger rods. So C1Q has a major role in attachment or anchorage of the whole complement to these antibodies like this manner. So these C1Q subunits, they are involved in the anchorage or attachment of the whole C1 molecule to the antibodies. For the sake of simplicity, you are only able to see two antibodies bodies here but ideally or in fact six monomer or the six IgG antibodies are required for the attachment. So we know that IgG is a monomeric while if we talk about some other antibody we have IgM which is pentameric. So only one pentameric is enough for the attachment of 
the complement in this manner. But if we talk about monomers, IgG specifically, at least six IgGs are required for the anchorage or attachment of this complement. Only then complement fixation will take place. But for the sake of simplicity, you are only able to see two antibodies here. So I hope this idea is clear. Now we should move towards the next thing. C1Q has performed its duty and it was anchorage. Then comes the role of C1R and C1S. After getting themselves attached to the antibody, the next unit that will come into action or activate itself would be C1R. Now both these things, C1R and C1S, they are proteases. And as the name suggests, they are involved in the breaking or breakdown of proteins, protein structures or protein molecules. So C1R and C1S, they will help in the cleavage of two things, which are C4 and C2. Here you can see both the complements C4 and C2. At first, C4 will come close to the C1 and with the help of the proteases, it will be broken down into two parts. A bigger subunit, B for bigger, B for B unit. So C4B, C4B is the bigger subunit and the smaller subunit would be called as C4A as you can see on your screen and then they will drift apart or more specifically this A portion here C4A it will drift apart or it will move away from the whole structure as you can see but however the bigger unit will form a bond or it will attach itself to the bacterial surface by this bond covalent bond and then comes the next thing as i have told you we have to follow this order here you can see c2 now c2 will come into action it will also be cleaved into two subunits bigger subunit is c2b and the smaller subunit is c2a it will move away easy way to remember which one would be left behind and which one will move away it's very easy they are a they are the a subunits so they move away c4a and c2a they move away they diffuse away while the bigger subunits c4b and c2b they stay back and c2b will attach itself to c4b in this fashion or in this manner as you can see on your screen now they are joined with each other now they have the ability to cleave or break down c3 now c3 will approach this structure and it will cleave c3 into again the two parts the bigger subunit c3b and a smaller subunit c3a and again the fate of c3a is to drift away like this manner and this particle or this structure c3b will also move away now as this structure here this combination or complex here it converted c3 into c3a and c3b that's why this complex is known as c3 convertase because it had the ability to break or convert c3 into its two subunits and then this particular c3b will come and attach itself to the surface of bacteria and then comes the phase when a lot of C3B will accumulate on the surface of the bacterial molecule like this manner. And after this step, now this is the indication or this is the signal when a lot of C3B will attach themselves on the bacterial surface. This is actually a signal or indication for the process of opsonization. Now this will attract the phagocytes now this c3b coated bacterial cell will attract phagocytes like macrophage and macrophage will come and recognize this surface which is coated with c3b in a funny way we can say that now this c3b coated bacteria is more palatable or more attractive for the macrophage now it will come and engulf the whole bacterial cell so that kind of process is known as opsonization and c3b here is acting as a opsonin a molecule that is involved in the process of opsonization and ultimately this was the first pathway this was the first route which can be followed by the whole pathway that it will ultimately lead to the process of opsonization and after that I will discuss the process by which the whole classical pathway will eventually create a pore or hole within the bacterial surface. Okay, now let's talk about the fate of these A subunits. What exactly is the purpose 
of the creation of these A subunits. Now these A subunits, they are known as the anaphylotoxins. And anaphylotoxins are the molecules that are involved in number of different changes that takes place within our body. Like these anaphylotoxins are responsible for the vasodilation or in very plain simple words, they dilate our vessels so that blood flows towards the area which was attacked by the pathogen and lots of WBCs can move quickly there. And these anaphylotoxins are also involved in the contraction of smooth muscles and they are also involved in the release of histamine by mast cells. So they trigger mast cells to release the histamine and which will ultimately lead to process like inflammation and so on. And as I have told you before that inflammation is good. It contains the attack of pathogen or pathogen within a smaller area and then our body is better able to fight them or contain them and refrain them from spreading. So that is the idea behind these A subunits that they are in fact acting as anaphylotoxins. And then if we move toward option number two, option number one was that this particular complex would break many C3 and the bigger subunit C3 will attach or accumulate within the surface of bacterial cell and after the accumulation they will ultimately attract the macrophage or other phagocytes and uh, the whole cell or the bacterial pathogen will be engulfed by those phagocytes and this process is actually called opsonization. Now the other option is creating a hole within the body of the bacterial cell. Now let's move towards that particular phase.